Right, so Helena, let's move on now to the other uh, two scenarios. Okay, so the first scenario that we are looking at is everything is exactly the same as in the first scenario with the exception of real estate. So in the first scenario, neither property owned any real estate at any point, either before marriage or at the time of marriage or purchased during marriage or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So the one number that we are looking at, and if people wanted to pull up the form 13-1 to see, they're going to be available. The only difference is going to be, you will see on the form 13-1 where it talks about property, there is going to be information about the matrimonial home. Mm -hmm. Everything else from the form 13-1 stays the same. So now when we flip into the net family property statement and everything for Robin is the same because Robin still doesn't, Robin's financial statement stays the same or Robin's information on the net family property statement is all the same. But now we're in the net family property statement where Sandy bought a home mm -hmm. after the parties got married. Right. And this would be information. So on the real estate section of his financial statement, the very first property box, yeah. It has the box for property owned on the valuation date. Yeah. This is where this number came from. That on the date of separation, the valuation date, Sandy had 100% ownership of the house located at 12345 Bay Street in any town. And the value of that house on the date of separation was $720,000. And that's the number that got pulled in for the value of land on the date of separation. Then we go through the general household and items and vehicles. None of that has changed from the right. initial scenario that we spent a lot of time walking through. Yep. Now on bank accounts, nothing has changed there in the way of property. Uh, we haven't snuck anything in surprising in on any of the other types of property that might be owned. So the value of property owned on the valuation date, all of a sudden for Sandy is $942,500. Right. Robbins is just stayed at 23,000. So people are mm -hmm. going to say, holy cow, that is going to be a large equalization payment. But wait for it, because unless, and we know it didn't happen, Sandy did not win the lottery and take that money to buy the home, because now when we get to the value of debts on right. valuation date or date of separation, lo and behold, there's a new entry that wasn't there on that first financial statement. Sandy has a mortgage. And on the date of separation, there was $700,000 owing on that mortgage. Mm -hmm. So that's now showing as a debt on the date of separation or the valuation date. Mm -hmm. So that number now plugs in. So now all of a sudden his debts or Sandy's debts, not necessarily him, have increased. So if you recall from this category on the first NFPS, that family property statement, mm -hmm. His property was 33,000, or his debts were 33,000 on date of separation. Now there's 733,000. So, what does that do when you work your way through the rest of the calculations? Property and debts owned on the date of marriage hasn't changed. Um, the status of the Rubens and the Picasso hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. Nothing else has been stuck in. We haven't played with anything. We haven't done anything to psych you out. Everything is all exactly the same except you now have included in the property on the date of marriage is a matrimonial home worth 720,000. Right. But a debt for the mortgage of 700,000. Right. So assuming everything else is the same, mm -hmm. that means that he actually has an asset that is worth $20,000. So he's, he's worth 20,000 more than he was last time. If you'll recall from the last net family property statement when there was no house in the picture, Sandy owed Robin $35,250. There is a matrimonial home that was purchased after the date of marriage with a net value of $20,000, which is a $20,000 increase in the value of, his, of Sandy's property. You equalize that. $20,000 divided by two is 10. So now with that big, huge, honking matrimonial home in there, Sandy actually owes Robin $45,250 because Sandy bought a house after they got married. And so what this means again is that Sandy is walking away from the relationship with the house, but Sandy is also walking away with the mortgage debt. Right. And they still have each of their property and everything that goes, it's just somewhere out of this, Sandy is gonna to have to come up with $45,250 to equalize their net family property. It doesn't mean he's giving our, 
It doesn't mean Sandy is giving Robin part of the house. Robin is not going on to title in the house. Yeah. It just means that now somehow Sandy has to come up with that 45250 to pay out Robin. Sandy might do it by increasing the mortgage on the home. If, if Sandy could afford to do that, but he's pretty, or Sandy is pretty close to the limit for what's owing already on the mortgage for what the house is worth. Mm -hmm. So Sandy mm -hmm. might have to go out and take out a bank loan. Mm -hmm. Or again, for that, for 45250 he may give her the Rubens or the Picasso. <laughs> right. <laughs> so again, it really doesn't matter. The bottom line is, and this is the way the equalization of net, the value of the net family properties is done, is you're not transferring property back and forth. You're just coming up with what amount of money will one spouse have to pay to the other for the increase in the value of property that was owned by either of them or both of them during the course of the marriage until they separated. So because of a matrimonial home with equity of 20,000, that changes the equalization payment because everything else stays the same by $10,000. So that's why in this scenario, Sandy is paying Robin 10,000 more than in this scenario when there was no house. Right. So the important thing to remember as well is, is that word net. <laughs> yes. Yes. If you're going to take into account the property, you got to take into account debt. That's as well. Right. Yep. And again, that's where it gets kind of interesting, though, is that if you have a traditional long term marriage and right. the parties buy a house within the first year or two of the marriage and then, yeah, they take out a mortgage and they, they balance out to the max. It's a CMHC guaranteed mortgage because they right. had a very minimal down payment. Right. They married 25 years right. and the value of houses has just gone crazy. By the date of separation, there might right. not be a mortgage on the property. Right. And if they bought, or if let's say if that was the situation that Sandy bought the house for 200,000 the second, the year they got married. Yeah. And now they're separating and that house is worth $700,000 and the mortgage is paid off. Yeah. That will swing a huge difference on the equalization payment because the house is now increased in value, but let's say $500,000. You've got to equalize that difference. Sandy is going to owe Robin 250000 as a result of that $500,000 increase in the value of the, of the home when there's no offsetting mortgage. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think that to our viewers, um, if they want they, as a helpful exercise to understand this, they can download these forms and kind of like try to fill it out themselves with like different hypotheticals, which is kind of what I did <laughs> on the weekend as I tried to understand yeah, how, how the offsets work and how the debts work. Yeah. yeah, so basically what we're doing is we are saying this is what Family Law Act says will happen unless... Right. So if you wanted to remind me when okay. we're done to say, we'll okay, so can you, can you get out of this? How yes, do you stop this from happening? Can you, we can exactly. do that at the end, but that means people have got to stay tuned and watch the whole thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I do have a couple of questions at the end. Um, so, but before we have, get there, when we're almost done, um, Helena, why don't you walk us through the last scenario that you prepared for us? And that's um, if Sandy had bought the house before marriage, how does that affect the numbers? Now, we are going to look into the situation. And again, we're going to go straight to the net family property statement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be probably the one that's going to interest a lot of viewers because we, we keep talking about you can claim a credit for the value of property that you own as of the date of marriage. What happens if that property is a matrimonial home? I mean, if it's the house you and your spouse are living in when you separate, but you bought that house and you lived in it and it was in your name alone and you had it before you got married. Yeah. What impact does that have on an equalization, right? That's the yeah, big that's question. Yeah, that's exactly. I get, I get that question a lot. Yeah. Okay. So here we are. So we're back to the net family property statement. And again, when people are looking through the docs, they can go back and find out how we actually work this in in the in the 131 financial statement for Sandy. And it's the one that's entitled um, a home owned before marriage, or words to that effect, I think. Yeah. Owned home before married. So Again, same rules, everything is exactly the same, only we're talking about a matrimonial home. 
So here, remember when we were looking at the, the earlier two scenarios, in the first one, and when it was a rented home, this was all zero. On the next one, it was that there was a matrimonial home that was bought during the course of the marriage, so it existed on the valuation date, right? Right. Okay, now they are still living in that home. It still right. exists on the valuation date. Right. So boom, there it is. There's right. that $720,000 house is Sandy's property as of the valuation date, which is the date of separation. Mm -hmm. Again, Household goods, furniture, cars, boats, electronics, jewelry, the inheritances, the sketches, the artwork, nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. Everything's the same. Mm -hmm. Nothing has changed. Right. We go down and all of a sudden here, you've got the same information for the matrimonial home. Right. Same information. There's a $700,000 mortgage on it. So still on the date of separation, there's still $20,000 of equity in that house. Right. Okay, now we go down to the part of property debts and other liabilities on the date of marriage. The first thing you're going to look at, this line, this should come up in neon and flashing lights. <laughs> Land excludes matrimonial home value of 600000 Because what Sandy had on his form 13-1 is on the date that he was married, he or she was married, the house that he and Robin are were living in when they separated, that he bought before marriage, was had a total value of six hundred thousand dollars on the date of marriage. Right. No credit for that six hundred thousand dollar property owned on the date of marriage. It's just like it, it's it says right on the form that you cannot claim an exclusion for the value of land that was owned on the date of marriage. So there's zero. Doesn't matter. The home is worth, was on the date of marriage, worth yeah. 600000 So you think, great, he can reduce his net yeah. family property by 600000 to reduce the payment that he would owe to Robin? Mm -hmm. You cannot. No. Under the Family Law Act, right. a matrimonial home is always exempted from the um, equalization of net family property calculation. Hmm. Unless, which is what we're going to talk about at the end when we're done. <laughs> so now, so we're looking at it, and yes, we've acknowledged the fact that the property was owned on the date of marriage, but you, it tells you right on the form, you can't include it. It's worth nothing. It does take the information to tell you what the financial statement says the home was worth, but you get to claim zero for credit it's for zero. it. Right. So you go through all of the other calculations, same as everything you did before. You get right. to the big picture bottom line. That is that whole key about the exemption of being able to claim a credit for the value of a matrimonial home on the date of marriage. It mm -hmm. makes no difference. It is still what the value of the home is on the date of separation that gets equalized. So in this scenario, mm -hmm. with Sandy owning the matrimonial home worth $600,000 before they got married, He's still walking away with that home, but he right. still, or he or she still, Sandy still owes Robin the same amount and an equalization payment as he would if he hadn't owned the house before they got married. Matrimonial home is always excluded from the exclusions. You always have to count and equalize the net value of a matrimonial home on the date of separation, whether you had it as property on the date you got married or not. It's the only item that you get the exemption for being able to claim something, property that was worth something on the date of marriage. You lose it you know, when you're talking about the matrimonial home. Matrimonial home value on the date of separation is always equalized. You don't get a credit if one of you owned the house before you got married. Big point that a lot of people just actually don't realize. <laughs> yeah, so, so actually, I'm um, just back for a moment. So the uh, 45000 this is the exact same amount that uh, Sandy has to pay Robin in the previous scenario where he had bought, he or she had bought the house um after like during during the marriage right it was the same yep okay okay so our three scenarios was right. a rented home yeah no no matrimonial home so no yeah. increase in the value of a matrimonial home during the right. course of the marriage that equalization payment was thirty five thousand. Yeah, thirty five thousand. yeah house bought after marriage yeah seventy seven hundred and twenty thousand dollar house but a seven hundred dollar mortgage seven hundred thousand dollar mortgage right that's equity of 20,000. Right. Throw that in with the rest of the calculations. You're equalizing right. that amount. It increases Sandy's equalization payment to Robin 
by ten thousand dollars because you're equalizing it right take that same scenario they own or sandy owns that same house on the date of separation Mm -hmm. But Sandy owned that house on the date of marriage, and the house right. was actually worth six hundred thousand when they got married. Yeah, but right. he can't claim that as a credit. Mm. He can't offset it. But remember, because there's there's a pretty hefty mortgage on that property. Right. So actually, what the house, the net value of that house on the date of marriage, was not necessarily all that high. Or if you wanted to get really scary, let's say that. Um, he had won the lottery, Sandy had won the lottery five years before meeting Robin and falling in love and getting married. Right. Okay. Sandy took that lottery money and bought a house. Yeah. And the house is in Sandy's name alone. Yeah. And when Sandy and Robin get married, that's the house they move into as a matrimonial home. And let's say there is $600,000 in equity in that house. Right. <coughs> Sandy cannot claim any credit for that house. It's a matrimonial home. He cannot get the, he cannot deduct that, claim it as a deduction for value of property owned on the date of marriage because it's a matrimonial home. If it was anything else but a matrimonial home, he could claim a deduction for it. So, so let me get this straight. All right. So I like that lottery example, right? So let's say mm -hmm. Sandy won a lottery, like you said, and, and they bought a home, but it was like a rental investment property, which they did not live in. Like it, uh, when, he, when he or she... Okay, you're saying they bought it. They yeah, when they bought it. Did they tenancy or did Sandy put it in Sandy's name? No, it's just solely, solely in Sandy's name. Let's just say it's solely in Sandy's name. Sandy- But it was a rental property, not a matrimonial home. Oh, no, no. I mean, like Sandy's renting to other people to generate- yep. So right? it's it's not the matrimonial so home. It's not the matrimonial home, right? So it's in that exclusion. case, in that case, uh, Sandy would, would be able to claim the credit. The exclusion for what it was- Yeah, for, for, for bringing this property in, so to speak, right? Like for- Yes. Yeah, because this is something that they owned at the date of marriage. So, so he gets to fill that in part six or whatever it was. I can't remember. Um, but, but, but if he, uh, if Sandy had won a lottery and uh, they bought this home, bef uh, it but completely in Sandy's name before marriage, uh, and then he, he or she meets Robin, they get married, and this home became the matrimonial home. Then the whole home gets equalized even though it's just under Sandy's name. Yes, but again, keep in mind that, okay, this is an investment property. Right. Okay, if Sandy owned it on the date of marriage, right. Sandy can claim that as an exemption, but that's not the end of it because what happened to that investment property? If it still existed on the date of separation? Yes. But instead of being worth six hundred thousand dollars, as it was on the date of marriage, it's now worth eight hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's been an increase in the value of that uh -huh. asset of two hundred thousand dollars. He yes. will owe a hundred thousand dollars to Robin as in the equalization process because the property has increased in value. You don't wow. get to exclude the property completely but you do get to exclude what it was worth on the date of marriage if it is not a matrimonial home. That makes sense. That I got it. Makes sense. Very, very interesting, these scenarios. So <laughs> yeah, for our viewers, um, these forms that we filled out, they're all going to be uh, made available for free. Um, and it, I'm going to put it up there uh, at the litigation help website. And the link is going to be in the description box below. So just go to the litigation help and you can just download these um, if you want to sort of like go through it slowly. Because I, I find it's much easier. It's, it's, it's um, I think I think it's a great learning exercise actually to go through these forms like slowly and to kind of really absorb and figure out how these forms to how to fill out these forms and also to understand the concepts of how equalization is done. Um, how long are you going to you're going to say something? Yeah, the other thing just to keep in mind, if um, when people download these forms, yeah, um, the ones that you download from the Ontario Court Forms website, yeah, does not have the handy dandy software running in the background to do the calculations. 
Yeah. So what you can do is go through and complete the forms by hand or even on the computer, mm -hmm. but it will not do the additions and the calculations for you. You have to run yeah. those separately using a calculator and you fill it in. I cheated putting these forms together because um, what a lot of lawyers do is they have a software from a company called DivorceMate. And DivorceMate provides these forms, but it's all got the technology built right into it that it will actually carry over information from one form to another. And mm -hmm. it'll do all of the calculations that are required and do that all for you. So you don't have to worry about punching in numbers wrong or anything else. But that's part of the service that you pay for if you hire a lawyer to assist you with this stuff is you know that you're guaranteed there's not going to be arithmetic errors in the form if they're using divorcement. Oh, interesting. Oh, so speaking of divorcement, I think we should also give a shout out to um, Disclosure Clinic. Helena, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, Disclosure Clinic? What's that, what's that about? Okay, the Disclosure Clinic is a, an entity that has been set up by a very, very lovely family lawyer named Shmuel Stern, who knows his stuff inside out and backwards. Very much an advocate for access to justice by self-represented or unrepresented people. Mm -hmm. And again, almost like a limited scope service type of scenario where he's saying there are things that as a lawyer I can do to help people in their family law case without becoming their solicitor of record. I can help them. And one of the ways that he figured out to do this was to set up the disclosure clinic where he has actually set up a website where you can access these forms. There are guides on how to complete them. And he basically has created a manual so that people can actually walk through and be able to complete their own Form 13 financial statements, um, both the income sections and the property sections, mm -hmm. by using the resources that are available on his website. And there's no charge for that. Or you can actually hire the disclosure clinic to prepare your forms. And that service will give you everything you need in this model because they'll, the Smule or the other resources that assist on the website will walk you through and make sure that you're getting all the correct financial documentation, um, give you the heads up on appraisals and what you need to do and how to figure out those values. And they would actually prepare the documents for you at a price. But again, they are not becoming your lawyer on this case. They're not going to be arguing your right to an equalization of net family property or how it's going to work, but they will help you do the paperwork that will form the basis for how you're going to work that out. So yeah, the disclosure clinic is just really, really wonderful for um, doing that kind of completion of a financial statement, especially when there are property issues. But again, what you're going to keep hearing is because once you get into situations where you've got more complex property cases, and as we talked about, we we did a scenarios that didn't include like um, basically Sandy is an employee and gets a regular mm -hmm. paycheck with a pension that he's got an appraised value on that did, we just didn't bring up any issues about at all. If Sandy was an owner of a sole proprietorship, then pulled income from that sole proprietorship, or if he, the Sandy owned a company and got paid through a corporate vehicle. Mm -hmm. then trying to calculate the value of that corporation as an asset and also what it how it impacts the income calculations start getting very very complex so again those are always situations when you're dealing with somebody that has got um, self-employment income or income through a closely held private corporation mm -hmm. you really should be taking a second thought about whether you're going to try doing this on your own or if you really need help you're probably not only going to need a lawyer, you may need, as I said before, a financial advisor or a chartered accountant or somebody to go through this as well, or a forensic accountant. I've seen it go that far in cases. And then I'm going to ask you, uh, we're almost finished, so I'm going to ask the last question is, um, do you have to do this? <laughs> Um, so yeah, a, a, a very quick question that came to my head is, um, this is what the Family Law Act provides, but uh, do couples have to follow what the Family Law Act says in terms of property division? Like what if they agree to divide property their own way? Is that allowed? Yes. Here we go. <laughs> we can stop the show. Um, okay, the first thing to look at is the Family Law Act sets out what the default position is. I see. Is that if there is nothing else that the parties have done or turned their minds to what they're going to do with their property in the event they separate when they're in love, they're on their honeymoon, everything's right. going great. 
if they just let things roll along and they separate. The Family Law Act sets out the equalization of net family property regime to say this is how it's going to work. Unless, unless the parties have actually thought about it in advance and have dealt with property as mm -hmm. part of a cohabitation agreement or a marriage contract. So you can actually opt out of the equalization scenario that is triggered by a separation under the Family Law Act if you and your spouse had entered into a valid and dem binding domestic contract, either before you got married, on the date of marriage, which is really ugly. I've seen that happen. It's just I don't think it's a very good thing to do is say, yes, we're getting married today, but honey, we're not going to do it until you sign this agreement, okay? And yeah. see how it goes. Or it can be entered into after the date of marriage. But the whole point is that, yes, you can opt out of the net family property equalization regime by entering into a properly done domestic contract. But that means it has to be a properly done contract. It just can't be the two of you sitting down at a kitchen table and writing mm. out what you're agreeing to. Each party is entitled to independent legal advice. Mm. Each party is entitled to not the same detail and depth of financial disclosure that you would do if you're doing like the analysis that happens when you're trying to do the equalization when a relationship is already broken down, mm. but sufficient financial disclosure that both parties are happy with it and they both clearly understand what, what people are walking into the marriage with and, and trying to talk about what the different scenarios would be with respect to property once they've separated. And like people look at it, like to put it as it's most simple, you could have two people that come into a marriage and both of them own property, both of them mm -hmm. own assets, both mm -hmm. of them have investment portfolios, and they may set up a marriage contract that says anything that either one of them does to increase the value of their investments or their real estate portfolio during the course of the marriage belongs to whoever got it. It's right. not going to be shared. It's as if they were not married. So you right. opt out of the regime completely. Oh, and you could okay. even have it apply to a matrimonial home. But again, we're talking about the value. Now, again, still right. there are still rules that protect a matrimonial home. So if the parties have a matrimonial home and they have a domestic contract in place, you can't opt out of your right to occupy the matrimonial home. Right. Yeah. So you can't in advance say to somebody, well, if we move out, you 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 have to you you have to agree now that if we ever separate, you have to get out of, out of this house. It'll be my house. You can't do that, but you can opt out of the valuation and how a matrimonial home is not allowed to be excluded, or you can exclude it completely, or or whatever. You might say that all right, we will share in the value of the matrimonial home for any increases because I owned it when we got married, but I want my credit for the equity I had in the home on the day we got married. Matrimonial home is defined as the home the couple is residing in as of the date of separation. Right. So let's go back to the scenario where Sandy owns a home on the date of marriage. Okay. But they, Robin and Sandy, sell that home and they upgrade after they've been married for six years. Right. Now they buy another home. Right. They are living in. Home number two. Yes. And they separate. Okay. Home number one is no longer defined as a matrimonial home. Okay. Sandy can claim an exclusion for equity in that home that was owned on the date of marriage because it is not a matrimonial home cool. as of the date of separation. The oh, matrimonial cool. home is defined as the home the parties are residing in on the date of separation. So there could only home. be one. There could only be one property that qualifies as matrimonial home oh sequentially that. but it is possible to have more than one matrimonial home <laughs> you can have a oh, no. okay. like if you've got a cottage that the family oh, yeah. regularly oh, yeah. goes or the couple goes every summer and they live in the cottage and yeah. the cottage is in one party's name and the house in the city is in the other party's name yeah each of them can claim that the property they own as a matrimonial home so you can have two matrimonial homes at a time Actually, you can even have more than two, but then you're starting to get really complicated and it gets difficult because when you're trying to establish it. But you, a couple can have more than one matrimonial home at a time. Right, right, right. But it's sequentially, if you have owned a real piece of property, right. a home on the date of marriage, right. 
It's not the home you're occupying when you're separating. So right. therefore, it is not a matrimonial home on the date of separation. That's really so interesting. It's not a matrimonial home, so you get to claim an exclusion because it's excluded yeah. property. Very interesting. And again, here we should uh, remind everyone that um, these family in, re in real life, um, net family property calculations are usually, I would say, fairly complicated. <laughs> Um, and there's a lot of things that go into it. So um, it's, it's really, um, I, I think that we, uh, we would suggest to people that they could just kind of like try to put the, the figures in. <coughs> to get an idea. So they get an idea of where they're going. Yeah, an idea. Yeah, but, but then ask a, a lawyer for advice to, to, to just to review it and uh, to make sure that this is correct. Uh, and, and also for advice as to, um, uh, you know, if you reached an agreement with your, with your partner. With your ex, with your spouse, on how you want to divide property, that you should probably seek legal advice on that to make sure yes, that you should do it by way of a binding, formal, right. correct, and entered into agreement, which is going to yes. mean some homework. There is going to be a degree of financial disclosure that is going to be required. Yeah. Suck it up. It's the best way to deal with it because if you try to force somebody into entering into an agreement and going light on the financial disclosure, you're leaving the door open for them to change their mind and come back and challenge it later. Like it's a lot better to lay the cards out on the table when you're separating, do the financial disclosure. So then mm -hmm. the other, you can, the, can't, the other person can't turn around and say, geez, but I, I would have never signed it if I'd have known because right. you did know. If you know what all the facts are and you're making a rational decision on your own to walk away from something that the family law says you're entitled to, then you're, to you're an adult. You're totally free to do that. But as I said, you have to know what you're walking away from before you can actually say, I know what I'm walking away from. Okay, so thank you, Helena, for sharing all this information with us. This is uh, quite a lot <laughs> of information I went through. Um, and for everyone, again, I will upload the hypotheticals and all the forms that we filled out um, onto the litigation help website so that you can uh, download them and you can just kind of go through them slowly for yourself at your own pace. Um, and uh, speaking of uh, the Litigation Help website, also remind uh, everyone that um, we have um, some great resources uh, for self reps. Uh, there, there is, first of all, uh, there's something called a law bookshelf. So if you're in the Toronto area um, and uh, you're a young lawyer or a self rep, um, there are, I do have some um, free, some legal textbooks that I have um, that uh, you're free to take uh, if you like. Uh, and, but there are also, uh, I also keep a core collection. And these are some of the, um, the um, textbooks that are pretty popular <laughs> and I kind of want to keep them, but, but you are a free, you know, feel free to come and ask me. And if you want to just kind of borrow them, if you like. And also um, I have a page for self-represented litigants on the website. So um, that uh, it, it includes like lists of other books that are, are online resources that, are, that I found useful. Um, and uh, also I have included a list of some of the case law that would be relevant to self-represented litigants. So um, thank you very much, Helena, for this very, very, <laughs> <laughs> um, lots of information to digest um, for this video uh, and thank you everyone for watching and uh, we'll see you at the next time bye thanks Heather that was fun take care <laughs> bye great